Well, as many of you know, and I will kindly remind all of you again today, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the land flowing with milk and honey and black and gold. <laughs> if you were to ask someone from Pittsburgh what makes them proud to be from Pittsburgh, um, they, would, they would mention a lot of things. They would mention things like, well, the Steelers, and who wouldn't be excited about the first team to get the six Super Bowls? They would probably mention things like Pittsburgh is a small it's a big city that feels like a small town. They would mention that Heinz Ketchup is from Pittsburgh, and if you don't have Heinz Ketchup, do you really love America? <laughs> they, would, they would mention things like, you know, the hardworking nature of, of Pittsburghers and, and it being kind of a blue-collar town with steel mills and, and just lots of pride in work. You know, after all, the Allies used steel in World War II, Pittsburgh made the steel that the Allies were using, therefore Pittsburgh saved the world. You're welcome. <laughs> Joking aside, um, one of the other things that Pittsburghers are proud of is Mr. Rogers. N now, I grew up on Mr. Rogers, and I don't, I don't know if that was like a common thing for someone in their mid-30s, but I loved Mr. Rogers. I can still remember sitting in front of the television, waiting for him to walk through the front door, singing, it's a beautiful day for a neighborhood. Would you be mine? Won't you be mine? You know, so forth and so on. Um, and then ending the song, won't you please, won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor. neighbor. And today we're gonna talk about what it means to be a neighbor because it's a question that Jesus answers in this account that we're gonna to read today of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is such a popular parable. And many people, even in our culture, use the phrase Good Samaritan. I was stuck on the side of the road, I had a flat tire, and some Good Samaritan showed up to help me. You can, if you type in Good Samaritan in Google and hit news, you'll see lots of news stories about people defending people, be, and they're Good Samaritans. You'll see Good Samaritans who pay bills, you know, in Starbucks for the person behind, you know, behind them. And so you'll see lots and lots of stories. But I want to look at, try to look at this passage with fresh eyes this morning because the danger of anything familiar is that it can lose meaning and that it can lose impact. So turn in your Bible to Luke 10, and we'll be looking at verses 25 to 37 together. And I used to have a seminary professor that um, used to open up his Bible and right before he was about to read scripture, he would say this. He's like, I will remind you. He had this thick um, Biloxi, Mississippi accent, I will remind you that this text comes to us with the same authority as if Jesus himself were standing here before us today saying it. So we together, you and me, we submit to what God's word says. Hear what it says. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, that is Jesus, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him. How do you read it? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, 
and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy on him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. This is the word of the Lord. So we walk through our passage this morning. We'll have three simple points. The first is an interrupting question, an interrupting question. Jesus, he's doing some teaching. He had just wrapped up this conversation earlier in the chapter. Um, He sent out the 72. We saw that, and we saw them come back. We saw him praise God. And and a man stands up in the middle of his teaching, and, and he's known in the text as an expert in the law or a scribe. And these people would have been very, very well-versed in Scripture. They would have known the Old Testament. They would have large parts of it memorized and committed to heart. Um, and the text says that he stood up to test Jesus. Have you ever been in a classroom with one of those people who thinks they know everything? And they constantly, like, they're constantly interrupting. They seem to know more than the person up front who's either paid um, to teach You know, they're trying to always kind of prove themselves. If you don't know that person, you're that person. Um, (laughs) Everyone knows that guy. Don't be that guy. But this guy is that guy. He's the guy who thinks, you know, he is an expert in the law after all. And he says, he asks Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Interesting, isn't it, that the expert in the room is looking for something that he ought to do, some deed he must perform to inherit eternal life. And eternal life for the scribe, for the expert in the law, was something that existed over there. Something that happened after he died. Something that he enters into later in life. We ask the question, what must I do? And Jesus, he begins engaging with the guy. And you have to wonder what the guy is thinking. He's an expert in the law and he's engaging Jesus who doesn't look like much. He looks like a common man. He grew up in a blue collar mason. And so he starts pressing in on Jesus trying to prove himself. And Jesus engaged with the guy and asked what was written in the law. And the guy, as he would have known, repeats the love of the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus affirms the guy's answer and tells him to do it, and he will live. But the scribe wasn't pleased with the answer. He keeps pressing in on Jesus, and the text says, if you have your Bible open, the text says that wanting to justify himself, he asks, and who is my neighbor? The scribe wants to justify himself. What does that mean? Well, to justify yourself is an attempt to put yourself in the right. It's an attempt to right yourself, to prove yourself that you are in, prove yourself in good standing, whether that's in the world or with somebody. And he's asking, he's trying to prove to him, prove to Jesus and assuming everyone in the room that he is in the right. So he's trying to justify himself. That's what the scribe does, trying to prove himself that he is in the right and in good standing. The truth of the matter is, the scribe isn't the only one that tries to do this. We try to justify ourselves all the time, try to prove that we are righteous, try to prove that we are in good standing with God or with others. Ask somebody, ask any common person off the street, why, what will happen to them after death? And they'll say, well, I'm going to heaven. And what will they, and you might get a lot of reasons why, but one of the things you might hear is, well, I'm going to heaven because I've done a lot of good things. I've lived a good life. I've loved my family. I've done, you know, I've paid my taxes. I'm a good neighbor. Uh, I, I do these things. And what that is, is an attempt to justify yourself. I am I am in good standing with God because of all the things that I do. They're attempts to prove yourself right. Church people do this too. 
We might try to keep ourselves in the right by reading our Bible, by going to church, by attending community group. The attempts to try to like earn, we might use those as attempts to earn good standing with God. We try to justify ourselves to prove our worth. We don't just try to do it with death and with um, church stuff. People try to justify themselves all the time. Um, go into your doctor's office, or if you're in school, go into your professor's office, and what you'll often see on the wall are, are diplomas, you know, saying that they graduated from Johns Hopkins or that they went to Harvard or whatever university is. And what that is is an attempt to justify themselves before other people, right? I have this thing on my wall. I paid a lot of money. I did a lot of school. I am worth trusting. They're attempts to justify yourself. We try to earn a lot of money and have nice things. Sometimes as an attempt to justify ourselves before others, to prove that we are in the right. And the scribe is trying to prove himself to Jesus. He's trying to say that he is in the right. And what will Jesus do? Well, he'll keep engaging. And when the scribe asks, who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus will tell Give him an inconvenient answer. Scribe asks, who's my neighbor? And it's kind of a bizarre question if you're sitting here in this room in the 21st century. Like, it almost seems like the guy's looking for an out. Who cannot be my neighbor? Like, who is and who isn't? Like, he's looking for an out. Like, who, who's my neighbor? Or it seems like he's also trying to do the bare minimum of love. Like, I just don't want to do any more than I have to do. And I think the reality is that both of these things are true for this guy. You see, in the broader culture of the time, there were literally rules built into the fabric of society and built into the understanding of Judaism at the time that, that said certain people were considered a neighbor and certain people were not. If you if you are able, you can flip your Bible to Exodus 21, 35, or you can just hear it. It says this in God's word, when a man's ox injures his neighbor's ox and it dies, they must sell the live ox and divide its proceeds. They must also divide the dead animal. So this basically written into God's law in Exodus was like, hey, if if an ox injures another person's ox, you gotta look out for your neighbor. You gotta sell that ox, divide the proceeds for it. It was a way of caring for neighbor. But along the way, somewhere in history, the interpretation of that came to mean this. Some rabbi wrote, when a man's ox hurts another's, the ox of his neighbors, this excludes the ox of a Samaritan, the ox of a foreigner, and the ox of a resident alien. So you hear what happened there? So God's law says, when, when your ox hurts another person's ox, You need to sell that and care for your neighbor. Then some interpretation came along that said, unless they're a Samaritan or a foreigner or a resident alien. So they basically decided who a neighbor was and who a neighbor was not. This is the broader cultural air at the time. This is what they were breathing, that there were some people that are neighbors, some people that are not. And so the question isn't completely unreasonable. And the expert in the law was trying to prove that he followed his interpretation of it, who was a neighbor and who wasn't. But Jesus, he won't have anything to do with that interpretation. So he tells a parable. Now, parables are stories that are meant to instruct us in life. We're meant to find ourselves in parables. We're meant to see where we fit in them. And Jesus began telling the story of a man who journeys from Jerusalem to Jericho. This was a really dangerous trip at the time that was known to have robbers. And that exact thing happens. As a man was journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, some people, they tricked him and attacked him. They beat him up and they left him for dead on the side of the road. They stripped him, took his clothes, took his things. And he was there with nothing. But thank God a priest shows up. Except when the priest gets there, he's like, I don't know if you're my neighbor. And he walks along the other side. And you can imagine if you're the man in a pit, you're like, what the heck? 
Where's my priest? But then a Levite shows up. And if you're the man in a pit, you're thinking, oh, thank God there's somebody else as I'm bleeding out, left for dead. But the Levite, he, he just keeps going too. But then here comes a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans and Jews at the time hated one another. So much animosity built between. Samaritans were considered half-breeds to people at the time. They were looked down on as a, as a part of a class of people that was lower. They were considered not a neighbor by the culture of the time. And the feelings were often mutual. And the text says that the Samaritan, the least likely person, sees a man in a pit. He moves towards him. He has compassion on him. He bends down and binds up this person's wounds. And as he's doing it, he pours oil and wine on it, presumably to both soothe and disinfect the man's wounds. And he takes Puts the man on his mule. That means he gets off of it. Takes him to an inn. Cares for him. And at great cost to himself, puts up two denarii, which is the equivalent of two days wages. And tells the innkeeper, you know, take care of him. I'll reimburse you when I get back. You see, the religious person was looking for an out for who his neighbor could be and who his neighbor could not be. And what Jesus does here is he opens the door and says that a neighbor includes everybody. You don't get to decide who a neighbor is. There are no categories of people who are undeserving of neighbor love. And before we're too hard on this expert in the law, I want us to slow down because one of the things that the Bible is, it's a mirror. That when we look into it, we see ourselves more clearly. So I want to hold up the story of the Good Samaritan as a mirror because I think that sometimes we also can look for an out for loving people who are difficult or unlike us. We come up with excuses with like, People just need to be more responsible, right? Like, you know, can you imagine the guy who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, he knew he was dangerous. If he would have been smarter, he would have traveled with a group of people. He deserved what he got from traveling alone. I have heard logic like that, that people just need to be more responsible, that they're unworthy of your help. I've heard people talk about the poor like that sometimes. Like if they just made better choices. And what that reveals is a certain hardness of our hearts instead of love and compassion. We are tempted to treat people who disagree with us as less than worthy of love. The danger, friends, of our current political environment in the hyper-polarization is that we've created people who are less than. Whenever the Bible calls us to love people who are not like us, can make you try to feel like you're deciding who a neighbor is and who doesn't. We can make excuses because we can be tempted not to help other people because it's costly. It's costly to help them. It's difficult, it's inconvenient, and it's messy the family member who seems to always need something or won't go away. Person in community group that seems to always have a crisis. We can come up with a whole list of excuses as to why we shouldn't help somebody. But what this story does is it strips away all of our excuses. And Jesus is calling us to be good neighbors because the hero of the story is not the religious person. It's the person least likely. It's the Samaritan. And then Jesus begins to make a surprising application. 
Jesus concludes the story, if you have your Bible open in verse 36, he asks, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The scribe replies, the one who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus replies, go and do the same. Jesus, in the middle of this parable, is calling the scribe to be a neighbor who has mercy on everyone. And he is inviting you and me to be the same kind of neighbor, to love those around us, to be willing to go out of our way to help people, to be willing to help people who aren't like us, who are different than us, who are opposed to us. He wants us to be that kind of neighbor. And what's interesting is the text doesn't record what the scribe's response is to Jesus. We don't know. My guess is that he feels overwhelmed because his attempts to justify himself were just met with the realization that he was not in good standing with God at all because he hasn't loved the very people Jesus is telling him to love. And there is something to this, friends, because it is possible, and this is scary, it is possible to know all of the right things like this, Pharise- like this scribe did and completely miss the gospel, because how you love others is an indicator of your own relationship with God. And this guy was realizing that he knew all of the right things, but didn't live towards others in the right way. He didn't love like he was supposed to. And parables are meant to invite us into a better way of living. And one of the things that the parable invites us to is to see eternal life not as something future, but as something now. You see, the scribe said, what could he do to have eternal life? And as I said, this eternal life was something on the other side of death, on the other side of the life that he was living now, and not something that took place in the moment that he was standing in. And many of us might think similarly about eternal life. Jesus died to save me so that I can live forever after I die. And what, what a better understanding of the kingdom of God is that Jesus died to save me so I can enter his kingdom life right now. And that begins right now. And it's a life that will continue starting now into eternity. The scriptures will say he justifies us. For those he justifies, he sanctifies us. And for those he sanctifies, he will glorify. So it's a life that he gives us right now. He justifies us, puts us in right standing with him so that we can live for him in the present. The kingdom of God is something you and I are citizens of in this moment. And this eternal life looks like loving neighbor, and it looks like sacrificial, radical love for those who aren't like us. It looks like Jesus, who came not for the upright, not for the people who thought they had it together, but for the people who are low, least, and lost. That's what the Gospel of Luke keeps showing us, and if we are going to claim to be followers of Jesus, we need to love our neighbors regardless of who they are. We need to love our LGBTQ neighbors. We need to love our MAGA hat neighbors. We need to love the difficult people in our lives. We need to love our Republican neighbors, our Democratic neighbors. We need to love our own enemies. We need to love people we disagree with. We need to love for people that look different than us, act different than us, because we're meant to show a love that points towards the greatest love, and that is Jesus. And some of you right now might be thinking, Don, this is all good, but it sounds very mushy and disconnected. And it sounds like you're being radically inclusive. And that's where I like to quote other people. Tim Keller said this, the gospel is an exclusive truth. That means it makes final Truth claims about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is real and what is fake. So the gospel isn't an exclusive truth, but it is the most inclusive, exclusive truth 
in the world. The gospel invites everyone to come to Jesus. And we have to learn as Christians in a really like polarizing times where people don't know how to do this very well is to hold on to the truth of what we believe with a firm grip that Jesus does make real truth claims that radically shape the way we live our lives. But those things also shape the way we love other people because we want to point towards Jesus. And so we love like Jesus and be a good neighbor, never letting go of what we believe. But here's the other thing I think we need to understand. We cannot be a good neighbor until we realize that we're actually the man in the pit. We need a neighbor before we can love our neighbor. We need a neighbor before we can love our neighbor. Parables are meant to, we're supposed to look at them and say, where do I, where am I in this story? Am I like the expert in the law here? Am I like the scribe? Am I like, am I like the, the, the person passing on the right or on the left? Or am I like the good Samaritan? But, but I think we need to back up even further because what the parable is inviting us to is to see that we are most like the person in a pit who has been left for dead. And no one can help except the most unlikely. If you look earlier in your Bible, Jesus said this um, back in verse 21. I hope you have your Bible open. Back in verse 21, which is before our passage, Jesus praises God, and he says, at that time, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. So that falls right before our passage. So Jesus praises his father for hiding these things from the wise and revealing them to infants. And then immediately what follows is a wise person, enter the scribe, the expert in the law, not getting it at all. And what you have in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke has such, situated in such a way that he's trying to get you to see that that story is, a, is like a, a mini story of the bigger story going on in, in the text. And this is where Luke gets, he's just an amazing writer trying to get us to see this, that what is happening is the expert in the law is the man in desperate need of saving. He is the man in the pit who needs help, and he doesn't see that right in front of him is the most unlikely person who can save him. He doesn't realize that he is the one who needs help and that Jesus in the story is the good Samaritan. He is the true good Samaritan who at great cost to himself saves us. Like he sees us dead in our sins and he moves towards a passion. And he binds up our wounds. He, he frees us. He takes us on himself. And, and at great cost to himself, saves our life in him. He is the true good Samaritan who's able to save. And the person in front of him, the expert in the law, doesn't realize that. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. That is what the text is trying to get us to see. And before you can be a good neighbor, you need to re you need a good neighbor. You need Christ, the ultimate neighbor who comes to save you and come to give you life, eternal life now. And you realize what the expert in the law did not. There's nothing you can do to justify yourself before God. There's nothing you can do to put yourself in right standing. There's nothing you can do to have eternal life. You can only receive God's kind love for you. And from that love, we can be a people who enter into that life now. Only Jesus can save. 